Parliament's Public Accounts Committee is urging ministries, departments and agencies to retrieve all monies paid employees who did not work for those monies. This follows revelations that more than 500 million cities was lost as a result of lapses relating to tax, payroll and procurement lapses. The committee Wednesday engaged officials from the Health Ministry and the Attorney General's Department. The Health Ministry recorded uh, some loss of some 25 million cities with payroll irregularities amounting to more than 600,000 cities. Speaking with Joy News, PAC Chairman James Kluchevergi said that relevant state agencies with such challenges must go after those who fail to do the work leading to loss of revenue. This is that we are considering. Uh, what is on end salary? Uh, somebody is paid for salary for work not done. And that is what I mean by on salary. And um, so um, we are worried, but fortunately, fortunately, the new system that has been developed by the previous government, um, which they started in 2015, uh, which is the, the ease salary um, system, where uh, before salary is paid to the workers at any department, the head of the department must uh, verify and confirm and authenticate that yes, this number of people that you want to pay are actually uh, working in my department. And for that matter, the controller and account manager can go ahead and pay. Previously, we don't have that system. So people are paid even when they are on retirement, their salary keep coming. Or if they resign from the office, their salary keep coming. But the new system that has been developed will solve the problem. And we hope that uh, from 2016 audit report, we should not have uh, issues of an end salary. So it's an issue that, that is very important to us. Because if you look at uh, Ministry of Health alone, the amount involved is huge and, and cover a number of people and they receive this salary knowing very well that they have not uh, worked for it and they receive it. And in fact, it is something that uh, we should take serious look at. People who knowingly uh, receive this salary for work not done, we should punish them severely and so that it will deter people from continuing to behave that way. So I think the issues that have come up is something that uh, the, the state agencies, the relevant state agencies must go after these individuals and more importantly retrieve the money for the state. Yeah. We will definitely, we will even report in our, uh, um, in our report, they recommend our report for these agencies to go after these individuals and collect the money from them. I mean, even those, those that are not available. In fact, they, even the families should uh, bear the, the cost of those and refund the money to state because the government cannot lose money like that. And we need money for development. We need money to do other things. So why should we pay somebody who hasn't worked for it? So we will recommend for the agencies to go after these yes, people. Sir, we'll all the agencies, no, if I'm not only ministry, I have almost all the agencies that we have, um, we have we have interviewed or who appear before yeah, this but committee. But now, the Wah Mag District Magistrate Court has remanded into prison custody for a week seven activists of the New Patriotic Party in the Sicilia West constituency of the Upper West region, including its chairman, Bukhari Dramani, over an attack on the Sicilia West District Assembly at Bolu last year. The seven suspects who faced charges of conspiracy to riot and rioting with weapons were part of a marauding crowd who besieged the offices, chased out the district chief executive of the area, Mohamed Bako, and locked his office. Join us as Upper West correspondent Rafiq Salam reports from WA. The seven suspects were given criminal summons on Tuesday to appear at the War District Magistrate Court. They are the Cesar West constituency chairman of the MPP, Bukar Dramani, Cesar West constituency treasurer, Mahmoud Foka, Cesar West Nasara coordinator, Walika Idrisu, and Poland Citizen Chairman. Ali Dumumuni. The rest are government appointees to the Sasala West District Assembly, Amadou Suleimani Zato, mental health nurse Suleimani Mohammed, and Gwemi Lukman, who is a midwife. They were charged on two counts, conspiracy to riot and rioting with weapons. Chief Inspector Daniel Yawyabua told the court that on October 26, 2017, 
The seven accused persons organized themselves with 100 other persons. MBC, the Sister of District Assembly, at Bolu. The alleged relatives met the absence of the district chief executive, Mohamed Bako, and then locked up his office. They further threatened to deal with him if he comes to the office. He took the intervention of the police to drive them away. Chief Inspector Dana Yebo noted that they have intelligence to the effect that there are pockets of relatives who are still threatening to cause mayhem. He pleaded with the court to remand the suspects in prison custody to enable the prosecution to make further investigation on the case and arrest the other alleged suspects who are at large. Lawyer for the seven accused persons, Obedi bin Sadiq, disagreed with the prosecutor. He stated that the fact presented by the prosecutor was empty, adding there is no element which suggests that the accused persons possess weapons or any instrument which has the semblance of a weapon at the time of their visit to the assembly. He noted that the accused persons for now are presumed to be innocent and if they are remanded and eventually found not to be guilty of the offense charged against them, they are not going to be compensated in any way and yet they will have suffered irreparable damage. He prayed on the court to grant the accused persons bail. His worship, Sidney Brimer, in his ruling stated that the fact that the accused persons went to the Sisala West District Assembly to look for the DCE and followed up with a threat to deal with him if he comes around is enough evidence who supports the facts of the prosecution. He remanded the seven suspects to prison custody and asked them to wrap here on November 8. The seven suspects were handcuffed and whisked away in a Toyota Land Cruiser pickup under heavy police presence. Reporting for Jay News, Rafik Salam. Wa. For the chairman of the governing new patriotic party in the northern region, and three others who were charged with rioting with offensive weapons and causing damage to a Yamaha motorbike were granted bail at the Tamale Circuit Court Tuesday. They are to post a bail of 5,000 CDs each to two sureties. The case is adjourned to November 15, 2017. Northern Region Police PRO SP Mohamed Tanko joins me by telephone for an update on this. Good evening to you, SP Tanko. Now, first of all, give us a background to this case. Thank you very much for your question. Good evening to you and good evening to your listeners as well. You remember somewhere last week, there was a disturbance at Karaga where some rampaging youth attacked the district assembly premises and also the police station and freed some uh, persons that we've kept there. And the DCE for Karaga and also the YEA coordinator were allegedly attacked by this rampaging youth. They made a complaint to us. We managed to arrest the MPP constituency chairman together with three others who were identified to us as the leaders of the uh, rampaging youth. We managed to arrest them and then uh, we released them on court bail to appear in court today. So this morning they appeared and we arraigned them before the court. They were remanded, sorry, they were uh, given bail to reappear on the 15th of this month. But before then, we had charged them with rioting and also causing unlawful damage. So that is the background to the case. Now, the police have in uh, recent times indicated that they've not been able to act when it comes to these cases because of political interference. All of a sudden, we are seeing that you're taking action. Should we expect to see more decisive action in, in the future? I don't speak for the Ghana Police Service in its entirety. I speak for the Northern Regional Police Command. So I will limit my comments to things that pertain to the northern region. Uh, there is no case that uh, political interference has prevented us from investigating in the northern region. 
most of these cases happen when the police is not around. And uh, people who are supposed to identify the uh, suspects and also uh, victims who are, who are supposed to help us in investigations sometimes drag their feet because uh, they are political actors in there and they belong to the same party and so they don't want to come forward to identify them to us. But in this Karaga case, the DC and the YEA coordinator uh, were very willing to assist with investigations. That's how come we've been able to arrest just uh, four persons, put them before court, and we are still chasing others who are on the run. So, uh, so far as political interference is concerned, nobody has been able to bring it to bear on us to let us leave somebody because he belongs to one party or the other. All right. Thank you very much, uh, ASP Tanko. And he speaks for the Northern Region Police Command. In another development, a pro-new patriotic party group in the Volta region has appealed to the National Council of the party and President Kufado to consider reinstating the suspended general secretary of the party, Kwabne Jepong. The group, which calls itself Friends of Kwabne Jepong, believe it is crucial to reinstate Mr. Jepong, especially at this time in the life of the party, because the current acting national executives are incapable of handling issues emanating from the grassroots. It blames the failure to deal with the issues for the act of vigilantism by supporters of the party. The group addressed a news conference at Ho Wednesday. Addressing the media, Roland K.K. Fiakwi chronicled contributions of the former general secretary of the NPP ahead of the 2016 general elections. He is confident that the suspended general secretary has the pedigree to manage the affairs of the party. He also condemned comments by acting chairman Freddie Blay and the Ashanti Regional NPP chairman Enki Boesiako for kicking against calls for the reinstatement of Mr. Japon. Related to the management of the rank and file, uh, recently there are issues of uh, vigilantism, uh, attack on DCs, MMDCs, offices, and all others. We believe that Komnaji Japan is well connected with the rank and file of the party, and that his continuous stay outside his office can be dangerous for the party itself. We believe he has the clout and the pedigree to manage the affairs of the party. That is why we are appealing. So, of course, it is timely. As per the happenings within the party these few days, I think the NPP is making a headline news about vigilantism and all that. And Mr. Fiakui questioned whether the suspension of Mr. Japon was a deliberate attempt to eliminate him from the party. The party was informed before this decision was taken that the general secretary and the others will be suspended for a period of six months and they will be reinstated after the election. That was what was known. So it was a definite suspension. That's right. So after the election, over 10 months now, you have not heard anything. Now we have 10 regions in the country. If some regions have started making the call, we are also adding our voice and we expect others to follow. It's not mandatory anyway. Mr. Japon, together with second vice chairman Sami Krab, were suspended in 2015 after they were accused of publicly rebelling against the decision by the NPP to indefinitely suspend its national chairman, Paul Afoko. Paul Afoko and Sami Krab filed a suit over their suspension, but that was thrown out of court while Mr. Japon did not seek legal redress. Fred Kwame Asare's report for Joy News. You're watching Join News Prime. We're taking a break. We're still ahead in the bulletin. NDC presidential hopeful that calls Phil Gabra chides President Kufad over his silence on the case of Ghana's High Commissioner to South Africa, whose recent controversial comments has drawn widespread public criticism. To make a statement of that nature, whether even privately, it's so unconscionable because he forgets that the salary he gets every month is not from MPP headquarters. He's also been speaking about his pres presidential ambitions. Meanwhile, Johnny is learning George A.C. Boating 
has issued a statement apologizing for his comments. This was after he was summoned to the Flagstaff House in a meeting at the Foreign Affairs Ministry. We do have a statement. We will be bringing it to you after the break. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to Join News Prime. Now, Ghana's ambassador to South Africa, George A.C. Whiting, has retracted and apologized for comments that attracted widespread condemnations from a section of the Ghanaian society. Mr. A.C. Whiting, whilst addressing members of uh, MPP Youth Political Wing, Tescon, said that his party supporters are more Ghanaian than, in, than others and that their interest is paramount to him. I'm just going to quote exactly what he said at that Tescon meeting and we'll put that on the screen as well right now so he goes on to say government is doing its best to create op job opportunities and me for instance i told my people over over there it is because of mpp that i'm here so that the mpp man is my priority i told them when ndc was in power it was Tracy ahoy who was there now we are in power so a Sibwa thing is here with you my topmost priority is the problems of an MPP person before any other Ghanaian. Take it or leave it, he said. Then he goes on to say, indeed, I'm not boasting, but I've started meeting the MPP group every weekend. I meet some group members, and I tell you, if I had my way, every job opportunity that will come will go to a test con member before any other person. And I know my colleague appointees also have the same feeling, except that because of IMF, we cannot do anything now. Now, the comment sparked outrage with calls on the president to sanction him whilst the minority demanded his dismissal. Now, it appears that this has gotten him to act or is getting uh, some action taking. Uh, the criticisms have uh, garnered some results. Now, I'm joined in the studio now by Elton uh, Brobe. He has a copy of a statement that was released by uh, Mr. George A.C. Boating a while ago, and he's going to be sharing that statement with us. Elton, what's in the statement? Well, uh, uh, easy. I will th the statement says that I have, upon sober reflection, decided to retract the comments I made during my interaction with some members of the New Patriotic Party in the Ashanti region over the weekend. Now, he says, I have realized that my statement is unfortunate and at variance with the letter and spirit of the Ghana's, of Ghana's constitution and the dignified office of high commissioner that i occupy i'm aware that as a representative of ghana to south africa i have a responsibility to protect the interests of all Ghanaians uh, within my jurisdiction and to grant them equal access to opportunities that are presented irrespective of their political affiliation i regret the effect of my speech delivered to the young party members which has generated public outcry i therefore wish to retract any comments and render an unqualified apology to the presidency and all Ghanaians. So this is verbatim the full uh, content of the statement that you put us a few minutes ago. All right. It is interesting that it is this is coming on the back because initially he had indicated that there was nothing, he didn't think that there was any reason for him to apologize when he spoke with our, our sister station in it's Kumasi. Sure, sure this is uh, like a U-turn. Do mm -hmm. you get the impression that this is as a result of pressure that has been brought to bear upon him? What I can say that Mr. A.C. Watton has been very busy today. First, he was summoned uh, to the Flagstaff House. From there on, he was directed to go and see the Foreign Affairs Minister, who is uh, the boss of all the uh, foreign envoys uh, representing Ghana in various countries. So it was after the meeting with the Foreign Affairs Minister that this apology came to. Now, what I picked even before the meeting was that the president had directed the foreign affairs minister to act on some demands. But the demands, one of them meant that uh, Mr. Isibuatin should meet with the foreign affairs uh, minister to go through some of these things. Even before she met the foreign affairs minister, uh, he had in his possession this apology. Uh, the ministry had a meeting uh, with him after which he was asked to put this out publicly. So this statement actually came in some few minutes ago, and, uh, and we have it. Now, the next stage, what I've been told is that the government is going to respond directly to the statement, and government, the st government response will inform the way forward as to whether they accept the apology or take further action forward. So that is what we're waiting for. I've been speaking to uh, officers of the Foreign Affairs Minister. I feel the minister is still engaged uh, in, <laughs> in, in the statement that we are all expecting to come out. So in the next few minutes or so, we should hear government response to this apology issued by Mr. Isi Boatin. All right, thank you very much, uh, Elton Brobe. And Elton Brobe is our presidential correspondent, and he will be keeping an eye on this 
particular story. So I think when we have the statement from the Foreign Affairs Ministry, we will be sharing that with you. But there's one other person who's been speaking about this issue that happens to be NDC presidential hopeful at call, Hugh Gabra. He's been chiding in prison to Kufad over his silence on the case, and he believes that uh, some string in action should be taken against him. He's been speaking with my colleague Gifty Andrew up here. If people hear that, I don't know where he is now. If, if he's in South Africa and you recall him, even to Accra for a week of orientation, that's an action. If you, s put a, you slap him and suspend him from office for 30 days, that's an action. There's a whole range of things you can do, including, of course, termination. But you have to make the judgment, because I don't know the entire range of things. He may have a good thing he's doing. There may be good parts about him. Mm. So you have to weigh his, the things he's doing that may be good. Yeah. But the statement that he's made that is bad. And if he's done a lot of very bad things, and this statement is the tip of the, I mean, the, uh, what's the right the word? The, the, the last the, straw. Yeah, the last straw that broke the camel's back. Then he's off. But if he's done a lot of wonderful things, but he just slipped and made one bad statement, then there are other Im intermediate things you can do. But you've got to do something, mm. not just sit there and smile. Well, you heard, of course, Phil Gabra, and he has also been speaking about his presidential ambitions in that interview with my colleague, uh, Gifty Andrew up here. We have that coming your way later on in the bulletin. We're taking a break right now, though, after which we're bringing you business news. Stay tuned. Hello, good evening. Time for business. Now, the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRA, is targeting a 20% tax to GDP ratio in the next four years. According to the Director General of the GRA, Emmanuel Kokinti, the current GDP to tax ratio in the country stands at 16% and falls below the required standards. Speaking at the launch of the National Tax Campaign, Acting Director General of the Revenue Authority said the target will be achieved by improving the level of compliance. The National Tax Campaign was launched on Wednesday to increase awareness and tax compliance among Ghanaians, especially those in the informal sector. Despite the dominance of the sector within the economy, contribution of taxes remained below 5%. Addressing the launch of the campaign, Acting Director General of the GRA noted his outfit is targeting an increase in general tax to GDP ratio of 20% as a result of awareness creation. The ultimate goal of this campaign is to increase voluntary compliance, thereby increase revenue collection for the country. In the sub-Sahara region that we are part of, the tax to GDP ratio is 20%. We are at 16.7% as we speak. Our vision in the GRA going forward is that we will do an increase of 1% per GDP per year, so that by the end of four years, we have crossed the 20% barrier. So we want you all to contribute to it. And so when we have greater compliance, it becomes easier for us to achieve the objective. The Minister for Finance, Kendo Ferriata, explained that the revenue collection was geared towards sustaining social interventions, such as the Free Senior High School Initiative. Um, so our... Um, position as a government is that we should continue to make sure that the social interventions are working properly and through that um, good citizens will be drawn to pay their due. Um, what we are here for is to really tell the average Ghanaian that given uh, the type of interventions we are making in the social sector, what is your role and responsibility in paying your part of it? And I think that's really the call um, for you know, your taxes, uh, your future. However, the British High Commissioner to Ghana, Ian Walker, cautioned that taxes must not unduly overburden the taxpayer. That the efforts to actually pay your tax must not be more than the effort to generate the income uh, in the first place. So tax payment needs to be simple, it needs to be consistent, it needs to be as clear as possible. And in the UK, as we've done things around moving much more of tax payment online using digital means, this has transformed, I think, how we've captured and broadened the net for uh, tax. Tax matters for Ghana's development, as the government has so clearly set out. Uh, strengthening tax system is central to developing and transitioning from aid. Again, the UK strongly supports the government's agenda here. And as Ghana moves beyond aid, coming out, having an effective tax system is the bedrock to really make that uh, happen. 
The national tax campaign is under the theme, Our Taxes, Our Future. Sheila Tamaklo, Joy Business. Meanwhile, the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, is demanding government to crack the whip on public officers found culpable with embezzling state funds. This according to the union, uh, such corrupt practices are not only unfair to taxpayers, but also defeat the agenda to boost the country's tax revenues for economic growth. The president, Dr. Ba Ma beg your pardon, the president of Guta, Berma Dr. Ufoyamiao, was speaking at the launch of the national tax campaign aimed at boosting voluntary tax compliance. Taxpayers pay for e effective running of all state institutions and will be very unfair to abandon the taxpayer again and kill his or her business. The most appalling, let me state, aspect of it all, which is difficult to understand, is the way and manner the money being dissipated, the money being, the taxpayers' money being dissipated with reckless abandon by some public, political, and civil servant, and in some cases misapply and misappropriate the funds without any serious effort by the government to pursue the perpetrators of this crime. Or looters of our tax money, prosecute them and retrieve all the amount with interest from the day of the commission of the crime. This is the best way to protect public coffers from activities of mischievous or miscreant society in society. GCNet, in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance, is to introduce a new system to aid the application for of tax exemption by public and private sector institutions in the country. The new paperless system, which will be rolled out in January 2018, will facilitate tax mobilization processes. There's more in this report. GCNet in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance have come together with a revised electronic exemption process that is going to ensure that all municipal district assemblies, you know, apply for exemptions through an electronic process. We're here to get in touch with several stakeholders in relation to this very innovation to find out what this exactly means to them. All public and private entities seeking to acquire tax exemptions on the imported wares will from the 1st of January 2018 have to do so through a paperless system. This was made known by the Deputy Finance Minister, Koko Kwarten, at the sensitization workshop organized by the Ghana Community Network Services Limited, GCNet, in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance. Public and private institutions have earlier complained about the bureaucratic nature of tax applications for tax waivers. GCNet says that under the new paperless system, it will ensure efficiency. Imano Dako is the Acting Deputy General Manager for GCNet. So that is a purely electronic transaction without any, anybody having to walk into offices. You know, the manual process also, I have to submit a letter to MDA, ABC, or, you know, or whatever, and then the walking there, the coming back, time consuming, and then the possibility of the human interface is for all it sometimes negative um, side effects also can all be eliminated. And that's the essence of doing it. And so it would all help in uh, expediting the process in terms of trade transaction and customs and port clearances as well. And uh, because it's also electronic and it's been captured, the, data, the quality of the data that is captured is also better than somebody paper being used and then one entity capturing it as maybe, let's say, in full as APCs and another say PCES or whatever it is, so that the data quality then will be consistent. Deputy Finance Minister Koko Kwarten says the revised portal will go a long way to aid in revenue generation. Speaking to Joy Business at the sidelines of the sensitization workshop, the Deputy Minister noted government has factored the need for the paperless tax exemption application in the 2018 budget. What we're saying is that that approval regime that at the moment is manual, people moving documentation from one office to another, is going to be paperless so that all the approvals will be given on the system and then it can leave the trails and then there will be better record keeping of the exemptions we are giving which will be necessary for policy uh, formulation but also to ensure that thresholds uh, given to exemptions holders 
are not exceeded. Acting Trade Net Manager of GC Net, Eben Teria Engman, has been explaining to Joy Business the key features of this portal. And the portal basically, there are three main parts. There's the one for the trader, which is the applicant or the agent, where they go on the portal and then they put in the application to the MD. The MD also have their side of the portal where they would go there, uh, assess the application that has come in, you know, verify and be sure that the application that has come in really uh, should enjoy exemption. And then they go ahead and then they approve the, the application. From there, it goes to uh, GRA, which would be made up of customs and VAT to do the second level approval. The government last September began the paperless port system to improve efficiency at the ports. That's all in business tonight. Thanks for watching. My name is Emmanuel Apuachi Ziafi. Good evening. An 11-year-old girl who was defiled two weeks ago in Kaneshi is now battling to get her life back to normal after the incident. Mother of a girl says she was out selling in the night when the suspect, a family friend, entered the unlocked room to defile her daughter. Mother of a girl is also alleging the investigator who was working on the case was part of a meeting ostensibly to get her to withdraw the case from the police station to be settled at home. Joining us is Machalak Baba with the mother has been has been speaking with the mother of the victim in Kaneshi. What happened? Said she, she was asleep. You don't know what happened. But she saw the guy putting his penis. And I said, oh, okay. So I was like, I wasn't, I didn't believe what my child was saying. So I was questioning her over and over and over again. She said, yes. That's not the first time she saw it. The first time she was asleep. She thought it was a dream. She saw the she saw someone like she was dreaming like someone has put their hand in a vagina and she she's like she woke up in the dream she saw the guy's face but she thought it was a dream so she slept again so this time she opened the eye and she saw the guy again and it's like two times so so it's like she has seen the same person twice so she couldn't sleep again and she saw the guy standing in the room and she was like struggling with the guy but she was afraid the guy would do something to her so she couldn't shout. I, I questioned the guy that very Friday night, and he accepted that, yes, he came here. And the first time, um, the first time it was like, he didn't sleep with her, but he fingered her. And so this is the second time that he slept with her. It's not feeling well at all. She's discharging, and each and every day she has to change pad twice a day. Even when she's feeling urinating, she will not feel like urinating. By the time she will be sitting down, you, you realize she has urinating. I don't know. Even when she wants to go to the toilet, she will not feel it. My dad said they should ask me the amount I have spent in the hospital. And I said, yes, I have spent a lot. I spent about 1,500, almost 1,500 in the hospital. And they said, okay, they'll pay that amount and then compensate the girl with 2,000. That's the guy's father. He said he will compensate the girl with 2,000. My, my, my father said, it's okay. They should bring the money so that we finish everything at the police station. And I said, I'm not taking any money from anyone. I will not sell my child's pride. The CID was sitting with us when we were seeing all this, that we would withdraw the case and then after redrawing, they should bring the 3,500 so that we finish everything okay. at the police station. So this discussion was at the police station? Yes, at the Dove Sioux Department, Kaneshi. And the, the police officer did not say anything? So all, the, all of this discussion happened at the Dove Sioux office? Yes. The, my dad said I should go and bring type withdrawal letter. Mm -hmm. And I said, from where? And the CID directed me. Kaneshi Post Office, there are people there. And I said, how, I asked the CID how I will type the letter. And she said, if I go there and I talk to the typewriters, I should just tell them I have a defilement case at the police station and I want to withdraw the case. Now, the mother of the victim, as you heard, made some allegations about the investigator who's handling the case. We've been trying to reach the said investigator, but we have been unsuccessful. 
we'll bring you more on this in our subsequent bulletins. But as you'd realize, we keep on bringing you more of these stories. But it's part of our campaign to stop the menace and also seek justice for the victims. So remember the hashtag we're using is justice for kids. And staying with the uh, defilements, Executive Director of Child Rights International, Bright Appear, is proposing that in order for the four-year-old girl allegedly defiled at Asinga Dadienten to grow the sound mind, the court should recommend she undergoes rehabilitation. Addressing a news conference on Wednesday, Mr. Appiah called on the government and other stakeholders to consider preventive measures to end all manner of sexual assault. Le young girl and the alleged perpetrator are all children. And one of the things that is expected is that once the court is able to settle matters relating to that, and wh whether the boy will be uh, uh, committed to the correctional center, there are still processes that we have to go through, both for the victim and then the perpetrator. For instance, in the side of the victim, you expect that the, the court will make uh, a pronouncement or a judgment that will lead to a proper rehabilitation of the child because the child has gone through some condition that that child is not familiar with. So the system requires that the child must be subjected to certain processes in order to be normal. But in most cases, the court do not make such pronouncements. But we feel that looking at this particular case, at least it should be a test for the court to also make certain pronouncements that would give responsibilities to administrative bodies to act in a manner that will lead to protection of children. Also, in relation to the alleged perpetrator, if the law deemed that is guilty, there are also processes that we expect that the, the, the system must go through to rehabilitate him in order to fit back to society. But in most cases, some of these issues come, we, we look at it, we talk about it, at the end of the day, we do not do justice. The whole administrative institutions that are handling this particular case should not always look at it from the, the piecemeal approach in terms of specific issues. The state must be interested in looking at preventive interventions rather than being adopting this responsive approach in terms of dealing with issues of this nature. And if we don't follow up, we will still recall the same stories in terms of dealing with the case and then leaving the family on their own. The Child Rights International also revealed that within two years, the Central Region has recorded about 2,000 defilement cases, citing an incident at Commenda where a nine-year-old girl was defiled so badly her womb had to remo be removed. Ms. Apia urged the media to use their platform to help bring the suspect to book. So for instance, from 1st January 2014 to 31st October 2015, the farming cases that have been reported in Central Region alone is 1,831, which for me is a clear indication that there's a lot of education and sensitization program need to be done in that particular uh, area. There are some that we've not, the media, do not uh, catch the attention of the media, so we're not talking about it. But as we speak, there's a very serious issue that we are handling now that, for me, is even worse. Now, for instance, when you go to uh, Commander, there's a, this nine-year-old girl. The case is in court, all right. But this, there's this nine-year-old girl that has been defiled. The, victim, the, the perpetrator has been identified, a standing trial. But what happened was that this guy uh, defiled this girl, and in the process of removing his manhood, I don't know how it happened, but the manhood came out with the womb of this young girl, as well as his intestine. And unfortunately, this boy has been given bail and is working on the streets of Cape Coast. But for us, this is a very serious issue that no court 
or institution to tolerate in terms of handling this particular issue. So we think that these issues that are happening, we should not take them for granted. We should, as people, have interest in a way and manner we treat our children, and the state institutions, all the arms of governments must be up and doing in terms of their commitment to children issues in this country. President of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG, Eric Opoku Mensa, is accusing the Economic Organized Crime Office of witch hunting the Vice Chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba, Professor Mauto Avoke, and six other top officials of the university have been interdicted over questionable contracts. UTEC has issued a statement on the current impasse, and my colleague Richard Kodunako joins me in the studio with details of that. Hello, Richard. Hi, Peter. Now, as Central Region Correspondent, uh, you have been following this story for uh, a while. Now, can you briefly tell us how this whole impasse started? Well, it started when a former assembly member uh, at Winneba uh, took the investing authorities to court and said that, I mean, there was a council that was illegal. Following that, the court ruled that the council was illegal, and so the vice chancellor and the financial controller of the university should step aside. Now, it follows and it goes on, and so there have been a lot of controversies about it. So yesterday, there was a, a governing council meeting, and four other people were interdicted. And so it makes it, it brings the number to six. And that is why UTAG uh, has issued the statement. All right, so as we have it now, UTAG believes that Yoko is which hunting the university, uh, UEW vice chancellor. What's in their statement? Well, uh, they catalog a number of issues, and they say, first, Professor Mauta Woke was not formally written to, to appear before Yoko, and therefore has not been arrested or detained as speculated in the media. The second one, at the time that the memorandum of understanding of the North Campus Road uh, was being contracted. Professor Mauke, uh, Mauta Avoke was deemed as such and was not uh, party to uh, this whole contract. And um, the next one says that current uh, acting vice chancellor of the university, Professor Afubroni, was the substantive vice chancellor who signed most of the payment vouchers with the former vice chancellor, Professor Asabri Ameyao. And they say that it was the expectation of UTAG uh, that having constituted a newly governing council or the new governing council of the university, an amicable solution could be reached. However, matters have uh, turned out to be uh, worse under the chairmanship of Professor Abakas uh, governing council in relation to the above issue. And so they go on uh, to say that although Professor Avoke has not been found guilty by any uh, court of competent jurisdiction, attempts have been made to withdraw all benefits and uh, some entitlement due him as the vice chancellor of the university. And uh, the UTAG is not really happy with this. What interventions are they seeking? Well, um, they, they go on to say that all this while UTAC has kept calm and believed in the legal process of addressing the issues and has stayed true to that course. However, while they believe in the legal processes, UTAC is vigilant and watching closely ver every development which is happening at the university. And they, they, they are therefore uh, stating that any attempt by any individu individual groups or institutions to use any scheme or strategy outside the confines of the provisions of the 1992 Constitution, um, the, U the University of Education Act and the statute in order to court public displeasure against any of their members connected to this case, a uh, strategic means of securing a judgment in the court of public opini opinion, even before the final outcome of the cases in competent court of jurisdiction would be unfortunate. And so they go on further to say that Utah will not hesitate to uh, to fully employ all the strategies available to it in order to redeem and protect the interest and image of members of the association, particularly the uh, autonomy of public investment. And so they are calling on the vice chancellor's Ghana, they are calling on the office of the president, and they are also calling on the Ministry of Education as well as the National Council for Tertiary Education to intervene in this matter. All right, thank you very much, uh, Richard Kojo Yako. The Attorney General has withdrawn a motion filed at the appeals court seeking to put on hold a high court decision ordering the Controller General of the Ghana Immigration Service to restore the work and residence permit of an Indian businessman based in Ghana. Ashok Kumar Sivram has for the past three months been engaged in a legal tussle with the Immigration Service over his residence and work permits, which was withdrawn by the service, a move which had already been quashed by an Accra High Court, which followed up with an order directing a restoration of the permit within seven days. This has not been done, but the state attorney handling the case, Jasmine Ama, 
headed to the appeals court to challenge the order and has filed another application seeking to halt it. She, however, withdrew the application for stay of execution, execution on Wednesday without stating the reason for the state's decision. A cost of 2,000 cities to be paid by the state was awarded as cost in favor of the businessman. Uh, Germany's Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy has launched a program to provide support for established business with a focus on Africa. Political correspondent Thomas Sparrow has been explaining to my colleague Mamazi Oswabwaze. Uh, the German government held here what they called the Startup Night for Africa, where a series of German companies on the one hand, German young companies, and African startups met to try and find uh, common opportunities and common challenges uh, as well. Uh, it was described as uh, building bridges between African countries and Germany, although it is also important to say if we look at the general panorama of startups that when they try to, to expand, when they try to move to other countries, they also face certain challenges, for example, different tax or legal system in the other countries or even language or, or cultural barriers uh, as well. But the project, this startup project, was to try and find bridges between African companies and German companies. Mm. There were eight African companies that presented their projects that could possibly enter the German market. That was one side of the story. The other side of the story was eight German companies that are interested in trying to enter African markets. Um, and that's what they tried to present during that event uh, here in Germany. Now, Ghana's quest to deliver a world-class land administration has been threatened by an under-resourced commission mandated to, among other things, prevent encroachments and provide high-quality, reliable and efficient land management services to clients. The situation, according to the directors at the Lands Commission, has largely contributed to the chaos in the country's land management system. This was revealed to Joy News' Latifi, briefed by directors at the Commission as part of our latest hotline documentary, Land Wars, which seeks to address the complex lapses in the country's land administration. There's a strong warning that I'm giving to people who are encroaching on government vested land that those people, the law will not forgive them. It's a whole mess. You are paying for a legitimate document, but paying more than the approved, the government approved fees. The Lands Commission has a vision to become the center of excellence for land services delivery with the mission to provide high quality, reliable and efficient services in geographic information, guaranteed tenure, property valuation, surveying and mapping through teamwork and modern technology to stakeholders. But this is just fine English that makes the Lands Commission look good because the myriad of problems in Ghana's land management system is very worrying. If they con con uh, conjure to come up with a fraudulent document mm. and our investigation does not disclose that fraud, then the, the courts can set them aside and the courts have set some of them aside. Because if you collude, it will present a fraudulent document to us. We investigate and uh, nothing uh, reveals that the thing is fraudulent. Later it is found that the thing is fraudulent. But as far is as... It, as is it then to suggest that the commission doesn't do due diligence? Oh, we do due diligence as much as possible, but you know fraud is... Uh, fraud can, can exist anywhere. Because if you you collude with the grantor or the grantees, all the parties around, and everybody is prepared to lie. And of course, the commission can go, go, go into their minds to find out whether they are lying or not. The surveying and mapping division is one critical unit in land administration. Regrettably, though, the director in charge of survey and mapping division, Wilson Kwesiopoku, tells me his division is under-resourced and blames the chaos on government failure to provide a commission with the needed resources. We need the personnel, that is the, 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 the human being to 
as one front. And if you, you have the, 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 the human being to carry out the work, even if he's able to perform a magic, if there's no machine, if there's no instrument, <laughs> he can't do anything. Mm. So aside having the personnel, we need the instrument to, to, work, to work with. Director in charge of land registration at the commission strongly came to the defense of the commission. Lawyer Ya Ajewa Buedi tells me just like every other institution, the commission has its own challenges, but is committed to delivering better service to clients. You know, Ghana, most of our institutions, we are under resource. You know it. How resourced so, is the registry of the commission? I, I should say that we are under resource. It's supposed to get a 50% of our IGF, but now it's been reduced. You understand? And DOJ, you know, it's everywhere, all over Ghana. Mm. It doesn't come the way it should. Does uh, that have any impact on Sure, 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 sure. I, I believe it affects even you, the private sector. Mm. Mm. After months of hesitation, former Minister of Trade and Industry under the Mohammed-led administration, Ecos Pio Gabra, has given the strongest indication yet he will contest the flag bearership of the opposition National Democratic Congress. It will be his second shot at the flag bearership of the NDC after his unsuccessful attempt in 2006. Your news is Gifty Andrew Pierre spent some time with him and has come through with this report. First, there were rumors, and then this. I would be an action oriented president. I believe I can do a good job as president of Ghana. Dr. Ecos Pio Gabra says he has been ready to lead the NDC into elections more than 11 years ago. In 2006, I present myself as a potential candidate of NDC. 2016, we go to an election, we lose. 2017, as you see me sitting here, by God's grace, I'm alive, I'm well, I'm a healthy man, I'm happy. I have my potentials, I have my capacities. Why would any right-thinking person think that I could not or should not be a candidate for the NDC of the party? He is now confident more than ever to beat any of the names circulating, like former President John Mahama, former Vice Chancellor of UPSA Professor Joshua Alabi, MP for Nadoli Khalil Alban Bagwin, and any other person should they all decide to contest for flag bearership of the NDC for election 2020. Capacity to serve Ghana has nothing to do with other people's capacity to serve Ghana. I think I've just explained it. In 2006, when I was standing as a candidate for the NDC, most of the people whose names you are mentioning today, they, they were also alive. They did not present themselves at that time as individuals who were interested in leading the party. But if today some of them want to lead the party, that's fine. Competition is good for business. Competition is good for churches. Competition is good in classrooms. Competition is good in politics. Even before getting through the first party hurdle, he is already considering reviewing some policies which key players within the NPP and indeed some Ghanaians would have thought have come to stay. The free SHS policy, for example. There's a serious potential crisis developing between headmasters, school bases, and the government as to how do I manage the school when I'm probably being given just five CDs a day to feed the students grown-up children who are between the, say, the ages of 13 and 18 or even sometimes older in senior high school you want they are fe feeding them with five CDs a day How's that gonna, how are they going to balance it it was not thought through well like many NPP policies so it sounds good to the ES because everybody wants something free and they lured Ghanaians into thinking that if they vote for NPP they will do such free things which when you look through eventually you find that they are to the detriment of the country. So they can reflect on it, and since they made a campaign promise, I'm not sure they're going to scrap it. They are going to stick with it with all these difficulties, but it will be at the, at the peril or at the detriment of a road that was supposed to be built that they won't build. It is a hospital nearby in the same community that will not be, it's the same government money. Government I will reflect, it's not, it, at that point, it will not just be a personal matter. There will be a party that I will be leading. The party will have structures. There will be consultations within the party as to what our manifesto should be what our policies would be, and we will review this program alongside many other programs and see what would be the best for the people of Ghana. Beyond the free SHS policy, he claims the one district, one factory mantra is a stolen idea from the Chinese 
describing the NPP as what he calls a sloganeering party. He proved to me his readiness for the top job with some rather emphatic comment on two major issues making the headlines, militarization of youth groups actually or supposedly affiliated to the governing NPP and recent comments by Ghana's High Commissioner to South Africa, George A. C. Boating. Dr. Spiogabra thinks President Ekufuado has no business remaining president if he cannot call his supporters to order. The president has a numerous institutions under his control. You are the commander-in-chief of the Ghana forces. Your vice president is the chairman of the police council. The Bureau of National Investigations exists to investigate and to identify all those who belong to these groups. There are videos of these. Many, many guys have come on video and said, if you don't give us jobs today, we'll come and to Accra and do worse than we did in Kumasi. You didn't see that video. They are, they are not hiding. And I'm saying there are members of parliament who say, we have funded them. We funded them. So we know where we train them. We know where we fund them. They are telling me as president, you don't know how to go about finding these people. Then you don't need to be president. So you get out. Okay. If President Akufado does not know how to find Delta forces and invisible forces, he does not deserve to sit in that chair. On George A.C. Boating, he expected a swifter response. It's taking too long. This is the kind of thing that within 24 hours, a good president will come out and take a, a, an action for people to know that, yes, this man is really defending the people of Ghana. Well, it, it's so unconscionable because he forgets that the salary he gets every month is not from MPP headquarters. The residence of the Ghana ambassador, Ghana High Commissioner to, uh, in, to South Africa, Watakulu, one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in, in Pretoria, beautiful place, owned by the government of Ghana. The car that he's dri he drives is funded by the Ghana taxpayers. So you cannot go and say that I'm only here primarily to serve NDP. Well, until the clock ticks for submission of applications for NDC flag bearership, Dr. Spiro Gabra tells me he is farming and mentoring young people. Most importantly for his ambition, he is working on the grassroots. Gifty and Doapia, Joy News, Accra. The deprived family at Clefe Demeten, the home municipality of the Volta region, fears they would lose their 11-year-old child unless they are able to raise money to pay for a life-saving surgery he needs to have as quickly as possible. Desmond Anku was diagnosed with a chest condition that affects the ribs. This is causing him a lot of pain and depriving him of the joy of childhood. Doctors say the boy needs to undergo surgery to reconstruct his chest wall, but the family says it cannot afford the 15,500 CDs needed. Fred Kwame Sari sent in this report. Desmond was born a healthy child. His peers describe him as a fun-loving person, but that personality has disappeared ever since Desmond started developing a lump around his left rib cage, causing him so much pain. His mother had noticed the lump a few months before his 11th birthday, as Desmond continued to lose weight. Doctors at the National Cardiothoracic Center at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital diagnosed Desmond with a chest wall mass with destruction of the ribs. This means part of his left ribs are broken and he needs life-saving reconstructive surgery immediately. <laughs> I took him to the Volta Regional Hospital in Ho, where we were referred to the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. I was initially told he had cancer at Kolibu. We were later referred to the National Cardiothoracic Center, and the doctor said two of Desmond's ribs needed to be replaced. They said the surgery cost 15,500 Ghana cities. But Desmond's parents say they've been unable to raise the 15,500 CDs needed for the surgery. Desmond fears he won't be able to achieve his dream of serving in the Ghana Armed Forces if his painful condition is not reversed. <laughs> I feel pains during the night and always disturb my mother. I'm scared that if I'm not operated on, I won't be able to fulfill my dream of becoming a soldier. Please support us raise the money for my surgery. Desmond's mother is worried about his condition as she's already lost a one-year-old daughter to cancer of the liver six years ago. 
Fred Kwame Asari's report for Joy News. Thank you.